Good morning, Radiant Church family. How is everybody doing? That's great. I see smiles out there, and that's awesome. And uh, this, I, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to, to be in front of you at, for several reasons. One, to speak some things that are in my heart, but uh, pre preparing for these things, these times, also stretches me. And uh, so every opportunity I get, it, it presses me or pushes me further than where I maybe have a habit of going. So that's an awesome privilege for me here and as I prepare. This week's uh, title is Prayer Endurance. And uh, prayer and endurance, put them together, it's, it's staying with it. And I realize that when I mention prayer, prayer is talked about a lot, that some eyes can gloss over or some ears may be... Uh, not be as open as they could be. But I just pray that you'll, you'll be um, attentive today and really dig in. I believe that there's a message here that's for everybody. The key scripture is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And it's very simply, pray without ceasing. And uh, praying without ceasing, the ceasing part of it means that we, we do not stop or give up. We, we do not stop or give up on praying. It does not mean that we pray constantly, although I will say this, we can pray a whole lot more than what we would ever think we could once we get rolling in that direction, once we make ourselves available for that. Uh, we can be praying a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more opportunities than what we typically take advantage of. When we talk about endurance, uh, and, and something lasting, something uh, continuing uh, for the long haul, we're talking about we, we cannot ignore the fact that at some point we have to start. If we're going to endure through something, if we're going to have prayer endurance, or if we're, let's just say if we're going to uh, play a football game, we've got we've to start the game uh, we don't endure unless we start. So that's a very important thing here is that if we're going to even consider enduring through prayer, we've got to start. Uh, it means never, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, never giving up on praying. Again, it doesn't mean praying all the time, but that sometimes we can become discouraged. Sometimes we can uh, be overwhelmed. There's various reasons to stop praying, but this scripture encourages us to, to never stop praying, to, to hang in there. Uh, there, should be a, there should be a time set aside every single day for us to pray, because if, if we don't, the chances are really high that we won't. And then another day goes by where we haven't prayed. So what is endurance? Uh, the Oxford Dictionary says, and they relate it to a race or some other sporting event. Uh, it, the, one of the definitions says that it takes place, uh, uh, relating to a sporting event, it takes place over a long distance or otherwise demands great physical stamina. And so endurance implies and, and means over the long haul, uh, doing something for the duration, doing something for as long as it takes. And, um, and when you're talking about um, uh, endurance in a, in a sport, like say a football game, you're expected to, um, for the game, you're expected to make it all the way through. You, you stop when they carry you off or when the final uh, bell or buzzer goes off. And uh, that's, what, that's what enduring to the end of that game would be. And um, uh, when it comes to, uh, so when it comes to a sport, it's, it's either a set amount of time or a set distance. Say it's a, a 10K race, you're expected. Your hope and expectation is that you would go the entire race. When it comes to prayer, it's, uh, it's the, the set time or the duration is for the rest of our lives. It's not just when we're newly saved. It's not uh, when we're in a crisis. It's not um, uh, when certain circumstances almost uh, uh, push us in that direction. It's an endurance race of, of uh, prayer for the rest of our lives. There are many, ty many types of uh, personal prayer, many different forms. There's memorized prayers. 
many times uh, memorized prayers, we were taught those as children. Our parents uh, taught us some of those things, night prayers, or maybe before or after meals. There's prayers from your heart, which I want to do right now because I want to pray over this service. I want to pray over you. Father God, I just come before you. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for every single person that's here, every single person that's, that's viewing and listening online. I know, Lord, that you know exactly where every single person is, hat, is at in relation to uh, this message, in relation to you. And I pray right now, Lord, that you touch every heart, that no one uh, is outside of your reach today. No one is outside of your reach. But I pray that there's an openness and a desire to hear what you have for everyone through this message in Jesus' mighty name. So that's a, that's a prayer from the heart, and, and that can be for many different things and, and, um, and, uh, and cover all kinds of different uh, needs. There's crisis prayers. And, uh, and believe me, we, we pray, and our Lord wants us to pray in a crisis. But to say, oh, my God, is not a prayer. I want to say that right up front. And you hear that, hear expressions like that all the time or swearing or whatever. And in the right context, that can be a prayer. Oh, my God, please help me. Oh, my God, help that person right now. They seem to really be struggling. But in, as just a casual expression, uh, don't anyone think that you're praying at that time. There's praying in the Spirit and praying as the Holy Spirit leads. And there's praying Scripture. And I'm, there are other forms of prayers that maybe are combinations or more of, of, of one of these types and, and maybe a little bit of another. But those are, I think, some of the main ones. There's also plenty of reasons, and if I can be so bold as to say excuses, uh, that we use to not pray. We might say we don't know how. And I have heard, I have heard all the things and more than once that, that I'm, that I'm uh, going to relay here. I don't know how. I don't have time. My spouse is the prayer in the family. I might mess up. I don't have anything to pray about. And you might think, whoa. And I have actually heard that. And not to call anyone out, and I don't want any guilt or condemnation on anybody, but when I, in particular, when it seems on the phone, when, I'm, when I'll, I'll, I'll touch base with somebody maybe who uh, has a uh, filled out a uh, communication card or something like that, and I'll ask them after we talk and we go through what they've uh, maybe uh, inquired about, uh, I'll ask if there's anything to pray about. And sometimes they'll say, there's nothing. Now, I'll give it this, I'll give them this, that they probably mean there's nothing pressing right now. But I, do, I did want to say this because we should always have something or someone to pray for. It, we just should. Um, my prayers never get answered. I've heard that more, more than once. I prayed for my aunt once, and she got worse. I mean, there's any number of different reasons and excuses. This list could go on for some time uh, of, of why we don't actually pray. And in particular, I'm talking praying uh, more than once, praying, uh, praying over a longer period of time. None of these reasons or excuses should stop us when, as Christians, we are expected to pray. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let in everything, by prayer and supplication. And that just speaks to that there is nothing that falls out of the realm of being able to be prayed for whether it's a personal need or someone else's needs or uh, questions, uh, need, need guidance. There's, there's nothing that falls out of the realm of, of it being uh, able to be prayed for. And, and again, that applies to other people also. From Luke 18.1, and he told them a parable to the effect that they 
ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, I'm not going into the, uh, that parable, but uh, I, I find it very interesting that the summary of that parable that, uh, that Luke uh, gave was that uh, the, the, the parable to the effect that they always to, ought to always pray. We are to pray for our leaders. There are scriptures for all these things, and, and there's plenty of scriptures that talk about us praying. We are to pray for our leaders and those in authority, for government officials. Pray for our family. Pray for our spouse. Pray for wisdom. Pray for greater faith. Pray for healing. The, the list is endless of things and people that we can pray for. As an encouragement, some of you may already be praying without ceasing. And um, this would be, and I'm just going to give two examples. If you say night prayers, if you make it a point to say prayers before you go to bed or with your children before you go to bed, and you're regular with that, and you, uh, it's important to you, and it, I'm sure if it's, if it's being done, it's important to the children, then you are, then you are praying um, with consistency, and that's a very good thing. The same with before meals. So you take a moment to bow and either hold hands or, or, just, or pray over those that are gathered around you for, uh, over the meal. That is, that's, uh, that's having a consistent prayer. But I want to say this, that generally those two types of prayer, I mean, I don't want to discourage that. Please keep doing that. But generally, those are things that we learned as children from our parents, hopefully, or from an adult. And we, and we learn those things uh, maybe from a very young age. And we are carrying those on because they were important to us then. It's important to us now. But I want to encourage, encourage you to keep doing that. But also, it is time. It's time as a Christian to grow beyond just doing that if that is the only time that you pray. And I must say this right now, I'm not up here. Uh, maybe I look like I have a, or feel like I have a bat in my hands or a stick. I'm not trying to beat up the sheep. Uh, I am just trying, there is so much freedom and power and um, things that can be accomplished through prayer that I just, I want to, Free one person, free one person up to start praying on a regular basis, and this will all be worth it. There's no time like the present to start or recommit to regular prayer. First of all, be honest with yourself. I, I don't, don't just listen to me. Don't, um, don't go off what I just say. Just be honest with yourself. Is prayer a regular practice for you, regular being at least every day, at least every day. If it isn't, or even if it is, and you want to be more regular or more faithful with it, ask for God's help. I guarantee you that is a prayer that will be answered. God, that is a prayer in line with God's word, and you will get help. You will get guidance uh, to start or to, uh, to be more faithful in your prayer for yourself, for others, for situations. Pick up a book on prayer. Let that challenge you. Let that uh, introduce you to maybe some different thoughts uh, and uh, maybe even have some, some practice or whatever in, in the book. And uh, I could go on with many other things to do, but the important thing is just that you, that you start with something. I think of riding a bike. Um, yeah, you're probably going to fall down when you're a young child and you're riding a bike for the first time. You're going to, even with a hovering parent, you're probably going to get out of their grasp at some point and you're probably going to fall down and, and, um, and maybe get a, a scrape or a bruise. But you cannot ride a bike if you don't get on it and, and start and at least try. And that's what I encourage you today is to don't let anything get in the way of trying, and anything to get in the way of starting to pray. Here I'm going to take, it's still praying, praying for others, but I'm going to take one of the things, one of the forms of prayer that I mentioned earlier 
and, and for the rest of this time, talk about that. This has been a very meaningful uh, type of prayer for me. I do not mean to um, say that, boy, this is the best way and this is the only way. I'm not saying that at all. This is just what has really worked for me, and I've seen the benefit. I've, I, I see many benefits for, uh, praying this way, what I'm going to be covering from here on out for me. And I pray that it's a blessing for someone, for someone of you. Um, that, and that's the, the praying scripture over somebody else. And uh, there's, there's the spontaneous prayers, and, and like I prayed earlier, and, and there's the memorized prayers. Well, you can very definitely pray scripture over somebody else. And the first one, the first scripture that I, I remember anyway, and it, this goes back a long time. This goes back about 35 years. Um, my wife and I are going to be married 40 years this fall. And uh, I would say it was about 35 years ago that, um, that uh, it was laid on my heart to pray, to start praying and keep praying Proverbs 31 uh, over her, verses 10 to 31. Proverbs 31, 10 to 31 is the wife of noble character. And um, it's, it starts off, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. It's a, it's a proverb of blessing. It's a scriptures of blessing and uh, gratitude and, uh, uh, and uh, building strength in, into the wife. And it's, it's, an awesome, it's an awesome proverb. Now, I have to admit, and my wife I know is listening to this, so um, I have to admit that along with most any person uh, when they get married, and maybe it starts even before they get married, one spouse tries to change the other spouse, or maybe it goes both directions. So I did not have the purest of motives when I started praying Proverbs 31, 10 to 31. Uh, but that changed, thankfully, over time. And, um, and as I... Um, read this scripture, uh, I noticed some changes. I noticed some changes, not so much in her, and I'm sure there were some, but I noticed some changes in me. And I prayed just that. That was the first scripture, our, our group, grouping of scriptures that I prayed for a very long time. And after a while, uh, I put this heading over this. I pray these words over my wife in thanksgiving for the godly qualities that she already has. And, and for these qualities to continue developing. My eyes in praying this were opened to qualities that she already had and that I, because we were so different, we're still very different, but because we were so different and not used to that, it was qualities that I could not see. So my eyes were open. And it, it changed me. I still see things when I pray this scripture that, uh, that I didn't see before. And irregardless of whether it has had any impact on my wife, it's, it's impacted me, and that in, its, in and of itself is worthwhile. I began, as over time, I began praying this for all of our son's future wives, and that would be a singular wife. Um, um, they were young. I mean, they were years away from getting married yet, but I, I prayed Proverbs, that they would find a Proverbs 31 wife. And... Uh, then later, as they found that and started having children, and there's grandchildren, uh, I prayed for, for uh, our nine granddaughters to be Proverbs 31 women to their spouse someday. And I'm praying for a 30, Proverbs 31 woman for Micah someday when he gets married. So that, this scripture had a tremendous impact on me. And it opened my eyes to, to, to some other, wait a minute, if I can pray this for my wife, I started seeing things in Scripture that, man, I, I really want, I want that for my family. 
And the first one I, I remember here is Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, this is an awesome scripture. And uh, the word of God, living and active, living in that it still has great power. It, it was not just powerful for, the, uh, for Jesus' day and for when the apostles were there. Uh, the word of God still has great power for our lives today. It's active. It, it is not a passive thing. It is not something that you read and, oh, that sounds nice, and, and then you move on. It, it, it changes things in, in our mind, in our hearts, and in other people's lives. It's, it is active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And, and with the double-edged sword, I understood that to mean, you know, if you're going into battle, you don't, you, you don't want an oversized butter knife to go into battle. What, that is only sharp on one side and not that sharp to begin with, and then dull on the other. You want a sword that is sharp on both sides so that you are, you are effective in whichever way that sword is yielded. And that's what I thought, and I, that's powerful in and of itself. That is a very powerful thought that, that, uh, that the, the word of God is that effective and that powerful. And it goes on to say that it, it, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Now, if you've been in here at any length of time, you, you've heard the teaching on spirit, soul, and body. We have a body. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, and the Spirit of God comes alive in us when we're saved. So body, soul, and spirit. And listen to this. If, if you recognize that those three parts are there, this, this double-edged sword, the Word of God, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. It, it's able to help us sort through our thoughts, our emotions, our decisions, help maybe see those in a different light. It helps us uh, get out of the rut or habits of thinking that we're in. It helps us see things from God's perspective. And it's turning it always to agree, uh, our, our thoughts and our attitudes and decisions to be in agreement with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God that resides in us. It's, it's powerful in that way. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And I mentioned earlier the, the sword, the double edge, and how powerful and, and effective it is in doing battle. As I'm preparing for this, there's a, a, a new thought, uh, and I, I believe it was the Lord just speaking to me. There's a new thought that came to me when, about this double-edged sword thing. And... It's that it is effective in, in, uh, in bringing about change or doing warfare for somebody else or someone else's situation. We pray it over someone else, and, and it's active and alive and, and doing things and, and bringing about good things in their life. But the double-edged part of it is, as I mentioned earlier with that Proverbs 31, where it changed me, when you're praying the word of God over somebody else, it changes you too. And that's powerful. I mean, it, it's, it, that will happen whether we realize it or not, but we can certainly make that more powerful and more real and more effective in our lives if we recognize that as we're praying the scripture over someone else, it's, it's also, it, Lord, help it, help it uh, change me. Help this, Lord, help... Your word divide my soul and spirit. Help my thoughts be in line with, where, with uh, what you want me to think. Help my attitude be right, be better than what it has been. And we can, so we can pray this in both directions, and it's effective in both directions. So praying over my family, I mentioned that first one, Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31 was the start. Uh, I started finding more uh, that I could pray over my family. 
Um, I saw scriptures particularly in the New Testament that were directed at churches, uh, like maybe to the Romans or to the Corinthians or, uh, or to individuals that I wanted applied to my wife and kids, especially, and they, the ones that I'm bringing today, this is not the full list or anything that I pray over my family uh, every day. This is not the full list, but the ones that I'm bringing to you today are about salvation, are about someone being saved. And I, I grew up in, as a Catholic. I was baptized one week old, as were all my brothers and sisters. Uh, that was the most important thing after birth was to, to be baptized um, immediately. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, I don't think any of my brothers and sisters remembered, but, uh, and then I was baptized as an adult uh, when I realized what baptism is and what I, how I wanted that power and, uh, in my life. But, um, so I, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and, um, and it's a lot, I, I love the Catholic Church. There are so many things that were planted and foundational in me that, um, that I don't know that I could have gotten another way. So I'm very appreciative of my upbringing there. But it, to me, was more about staying in line. As I got older, it was more about staying in line and, and keeping in line with the church than it was about relationship. And one of the most precious things to me after, when I got saved in my mid-20s, uh, maybe the latter 20s, uh, 26, 27, uh, in that range there was that was relationship. That was, I got actually excited about a relationship with God, even though I'd been in church my entire life. And so that was, that was something that really spoke to me. I knew that I had family members and others who did not have that excitement, who did not have that new life. And, and that's where I started uh, finding and looking for scriptures that pray salvation or someone towards uh, making the decision of being saved. Romans 10, 1, 1 to 3 is, a, is a, a key one for me. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. And the first thing I did uh, was that with the first line there, at least the first line on my page, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites was, I want this for my family. So I changed that. Felt guilty a little while, because you don't change scripture. But you do apply scripture. And that's what I was doing. I was applying this scripture to my family. So I changed that to, to my family. Uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for my family is that they may be saved. I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. It was based more on expectations. Um, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own by remaining in church, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And God's righteousness is very simply uh, that we believe that he died for our sins, we confess our sins, and we, we invite him into our life and we're saved. And that's something that is um, quite foreign uh, to many folks in religion. And even though that might be in church on a regular basis, it's a, it's a foreign concept because they've been brought up that there are different expectations. Uh, Romans 10, 9, and that scripture is not going to come up, but I just want to quote it here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I just wanted that for family members, I wanted it for, some, for coworkers. There were various people, and people would come in and, and go through my life, and, and I, would just, I, I, would, um, I would insert their names in here and, uh, or pray. I pray most often for my family, which would be the family I come from, uh, my wife's family, family she comes from, and then our family. 
Another scripture here, Isaiah 65, 1. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I found this scripture to be a great comfort because when, you're, when you start paying attention to other folks and their walk or their non-walk with the Lord, you wonder if they have any, any inkling at all of, uh, of, of God uh, or if they're running hard away from him or where, where they're at. And this scripture brings me comfort because I, it, it talks about, I, I, this is the Lord speaking, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. So whether they were seeking, whether they are seeking or pursuing God or not, God is there for them. He is revealing himself to them. And example, something that happened time after time, you know, in the more rebellious years of some of our sons, uh, they'd get in trouble. And, uh, and we'd hear about it. We certainly, we still don't know everything that went on, but, uh, and that's okay. We're good with that. Um, but we would, we would hear from them sometimes. They'd come home. And I remember in particular a few times where uh, almost they had to say something. They had to say. They had to tell what, they, what just happened. And may, maybe it was uh, something related to a car or whatever. I mean, it, the details doesn't matter what it is. But I'll tell you the number of times that they, they'd be telling their story but, and then their words, that mean not steering at all, not pushing in that direction at all, but in their own words, God really, God really got me through that. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. And time after time, I heard that. So this scripture just bears out that there may not be the look or the, uh, the it may not look like uh, someone is in pursuit of God or even open to him but God is there for them at every opportunity revealing himself. Luke 10, 2. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Sometimes we are not able to reach a person, and that seems in particular maybe a family member uh, where... uh, we want to reach them for the Lord with the gospel, but we're shut out. And um, in those circumstances, I, I take great comfort in this and that I'm not the only one. I am not the only one praying for this brother or for this uh, coworker. There are other laborers out there. And I've, I'm praying for those labors, laborers to rise up to be bold, and to, and to do what God is leading them to do in, the, in that person's life. We're not alone when we're praying for somebody else's salvation. Pray for laborers. Pray for those that are around them or that have an impact or influence on them. We may have lost our influence with somebody, but somebody has influence with that person. And not that we don't pray for them at all. Uh, we still pray for them. But I, this is a very powerful way to pray for them. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Unless the Father who sent me draws him. And when we're, again, mindful of someone else, we can have the thought pass through our mind that maybe, maybe they're just not, um, maybe they're just not being called. Maybe they're, they're, um, they made the decision and they're, they're not going to be reached. And um, we can just come to the conclusion, well, maybe it's not for them. And I want to just, I want to read the next two scriptures just to say that that is definitely not true. In 2 Peter 3, 9, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
There, this scripture talks about the patience of God. We, of course, w- would want that person to come into the fold, uh, accept Christ now, and 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 very or very soon. We we would want that. That's our that's our human nature. Whatever we pray for, whatever is on our heart, we kind of want it now. And sometimes we insist on it now. But the Lord is in this for the long haul, and He does not. Um, he doesn't panic or uh, maybe fret like we do when someone is not responding. So that's the first part. He's, he's very patient with people. He never forces himself on, on another person, he, but he's there. He's available. And um, he's not wanting anyone, as the scripture ends, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So if that thought ever rises up, that, um, that maybe so-and-so, he's just going to be lost. That's, that's a lie from the enemy. That's a lie from the enemy to get us to give up and to stop praying for that person and to, uh, to let, just let them go their own way. I want to throw another thing in here real quick. Uh, another, another, I can't preach or talk too long about forgiveness today, but we need to make sure that we are walking in forgiveness with, uh, with everyone, that we don't let unforgiveness creep in. Because uh, many times it's uh, those that stretch us the hardest or run the furthest far from us or seem the furthest from God uh, have hurt us or whatever in some way, or maybe they've hurt family members. And, it, and we can become offended. We can become hurt and stop praying. That's, I, that is something we cannot do. We cannot afford to do as Christians. Uh, we are commanded to forgive and to forgive everyone for whatever they've done. And it doesn't mean uh, best buds or uh, BFFs or anything like that necessarily. But what it does mean is maybe new boundaries. But you never, even if you don't see them or get together with them, you never stop praying for them. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's never forget that we're all sinners. We have been blessed with salvation. Yes, we made the decision if, if, in our, uh, as we got older. Yes, we were involved in this. Yes, it's, but it's a blessing that we chose to participate in as far as being saved. But before that, before we accepted the Lord into our life, before uh, we realized that he for, uh, died on the cross to forgive our sins, we were in sin. All fall short of the glory of God. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all in the same boat. That's another reason. Somebody prayed us into the kingdom. If, if, uh, it, took, if it took a while for us to, to accept Christ, someone was praying for us. Someone was a laborer for us. Someone got us from a, a life of sin into the kingdom. And, and we want to do that for someone else. Hebrews 4.1, and this is from the translator's New Testament, and I want to, I'm emphasizing that. I don't normally talk about the version, but uh, it's worded so particularly in the translator's New Testament that, um, and this is, this is just an awesome scripture. Now, as long as God's promise that we should go in and rest with him still stands, the one thing we should fear is that any one of you should think he has missed his chance. I'll I'll go through this a little bit at a time. Now, as long as God's promise that we should go in and rest with him still stands, can we agree, based on what we talked about earlier, and and we probably knew even before we came in here today, can we agree that God's promise still stands? his call, his desire to have everyone saved, that, that, uh, to have everyone come into his fold and into his kingdom still stands. We can agree on that. Now, as long as God's promise that we should go in and rest with him still stands, so that still stands, the one thing we should fear 
is that any one of you should think he has missed his chance. And um, so it, one thing any one of us should fear, in other words, we, we, we don't want to do this. We don't, wanna, we don't want to get to a point or be at a point where we think that we've missed our chance. And I want to tell you that it is staggering. It is staggering how many people believe exactly that, that they've missed their chance. And I'm talking saved people who maybe fell away or have fallen and they're maybe still in that state, that, or ones that have never been saved. There are so many people that believe in their, in their heart that they have missed their chance. And this scripture is so powerful. I know that I'm praying for some folks right now that believe this or that, um, that maybe they're, they're starting to move off of it, but they, they've missed their chance. They've gone too far down the road the wrong way. They've, they've, they've committed the unpardonable sin. They've done whatever it is, the, and the enemy will just magnify that. He'll magnify that to a person's heart so they give up. And this scripture, I love it because it, it just, there is never a time when it's too late for somebody to get saved. And, and that's why we keep at it. That's why we never stop. It's, 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 it's never too late. And, this, and when we, I'm praying this, uh, if, if someone comes to mind while I'm praying this scripture, and, and, and it could be a, a few people maybe come to mind, I'll just say, Lord, if that's where they're at, uh, snap them out of it. Blinders come off their eyes. I come against the lie of the enemy that it's not too late. That he's telling them it's too late or that they've gone too far down the wrong road. It's not too late. They are still, they still can be saved. And I pray that uh, in my own words, in addition to the scripture over them. Um, there's another part of this that again, <laughs> um, not quite for this, for the, in preparing for this teaching, but not that long ago. There's another insight that the Lord gave me on this. And, um, and it involves the last part here. The one thing we should fear is that any one of you should think he has missed his chance. And this is the scarier part. I earlier talked about someone thinking or feeling that it's too late for them. As Christians we need to make sure that we haven't put somebody in that category, that we haven't given up on them. And we do sometimes give up on other people, uh, especially in terms of salvation. They're, they, they can be very frustrating in many different ways. But it's, it's, it's very important that we as believers make sure that, that we should fear, we should make sure that any one of you, that I, should think that that person has missed their chance. Then we're in the wrong. And we, we want to correct that as soon as possible. This last scripture that I'll share, of the ones that I pray over my family, uh, is just... Just an encouragement. Um, I, I don't know if it's right to say it's a fun one or whatever, but uh, anyway, it's an, it's an encouragement. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And I, I love praying that over. Uh, and, it, and, you know, it's just my wife and I at home right now, but it's still, I pray that over our enlarged family. And, um, and it's... it's it's just an encouragement that if, if someone ha struggles or if someone falls away or if someone is not yet in the fold uh, and, in fo and following Jesus, that God is, God's heart is for the entire family to be saved. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't let that over, um, uh, we shouldn't walk in guilt or condemnation if, if they're not or if our family is not that way. When I started praying this, uh, 35 or so years ago, uh, they were too young 
some of them to make the decision yet. I was praying this and praying for my kids and then for spouses and to come into the fold. And um, it, it's, it's just such an important thing to pray over your family in thanksgiving for those that already are and praying it for those that still are, are not there. And, um, and just, I, I look at it as encouragement because it's God's heart. It's God's heart for everyone in my family to be saved. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust him with that. Our, our God is all about saving everyone. Let's become an active part in his plan by praying. Hoping is not praying. Wishing is not praying. Again, just a quick review. There's the different types of prayer I talk. I spent the second half of this on, um, on um, uh, praying scriptures over our family or over others. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that's not the only thing. If that clicks with you, run with it and grab uh, grab it and run with it. Um, but again, there's the other types of prayers. They're memorized, the prayers from your heart, praying in the spirit or praying as the spirit leads. And, but if, it's, if it is, uh, if you're willing to try this praying scripture or dive in deeper with praying scripture over family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, and whoever the Lord lays on your heart, um, just don't be afraid of the Bible. It doesn't have to make sense the first time you read it. It doesn't have to, it, maybe it, um, or that you read a certain section or a new chapter. It doesn't have to always make sense. Remember, he's working on both ends of this. He's working on who you're praying scripture over, and he's working on you as you're reading it. So don't sweat it if you don't understand it or if, if it raises more questions than, than, than it provides answers. It's okay. Just, the, just the, the decision and action in doing it is, is automatically a blessing for you and for somebody else. Use a concordance. You know, I, I read you scriptures that uh, lean towards salvation. There's all kinds of other things that, that you can be praying for and, and maybe grab several scriptures that pertain to that. You know, when we were going, still are to a degree, but when we were hot and heavy in the pandemic, I, I got overwhelmed with a number of people that needed prayer. Um... And I wasn't the only one praying by any means. But somewhere through there, I looked up uh, prayer, praying for healing. And, uh, and I found maybe 50 scriptures related to that. And I printed those out. And I take one page of that every day, maybe 20 scriptures that relate to healing. And I pray that one page over all those that are in need of healing. So you can find a topic, or maybe you're, maybe you're struggling with anxiety or with depression. You can, you can look up anxiety or depression, and, and there are scriptures that, that will help with that, or you're, maybe you're praying it over somebody else. You can find scriptures that relate to what your needs are or what someone else's needs are. And you're, then you're not just praying a general, general prayer over them or yourself. You're praying a specific prayer with using those scriptures. Use a concordance. In the back of most Bibles, there is a concordance. Excuse me. That's a fancy word for um, they pick out, uh, they select certain words, uh, and it's many. It's, it's, uh, it's many words. It's not a complete dictionary or anything like that, but it, it takes words like faith, or hope, or patience, or fear, or anxiety, or healing. It takes subjects like that, and it shows you in the Bible every place that the word hope is used, or that the word faith is used, or that the word uh, healing is used. And you get a broad spectrum of scriptures related to that topic. That, that, you're, that, that you are interested in or that you need right now. So you can do that with a concordance. 
I use this app all the time, or this, uh, uh, it's www.openbible.info. And this is really neat because in there, on there, is there there's a section that, that calls out, um, what does the Bible say about? And, um, and then you just type in faith, uh, healing, um, discouragement, uh, depression. You, you type in what you want, and then you get around 40 or 50 scriptures that relate to that topic. Again, it's, it's www.openbible.info. Very handy tool. Try a daily devotional. If, if getting into the Word is a challenge, try a daily devotional. It will help you get into God's Word and, and got, provide some guidance along the way. There's the Bible Promises book, there, and there's many, many, many uh, Bible Promise book. Again, this takes usually a need or a subject, um, and uh, like say, uh, healing again, or um, discouragement, and it goes through and provides several scriptures related to that. That's a way that you can come up with your li own list of scriptures to pray. And then there's also this tool, which we are very happy to give out, is who I am in Christ. This is what someone has put together and blesses us with that talks about every, or puts every scripture in here that, uh, that says who we are as a believer, as a, as a follower of Jesus. And I guarantee you that there's scriptures that they would inspire in here. But the main thing is, is that we just get started. Um, what to do and how to do it, can, can, we could have all day Saturday seminars and all that, but it would mean nothing if we just don't get started, if we just don't take the step. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't let anything keep you from praying and from praying God's Word. Uh, and reading God's Word for your own benefit and for the benefit of others. My prayer is that no one will settle for a day without prayer, with a, for, and then with one day adding another to it, and then a week, a month, and years. It is so powerful. I want to read you something, and my wife uh, has this on our refrigerator. It's a, a quotation by Peter Kreeft. I strongly suspect that if we saw all the difference even the tiniest of our prayers make, and all the people those little prayers were destined to affect, and all the consequences of those prayers down through the centuries, we would be so paralyzed with awe at the power of prayer that we would be unable to get off of our knees for the rest of our lives. Let's pray. As the prayer partners coming forward, let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you, Lord, that these are open and hungry hearts. I thank you, Father, that you are reaching every single person where they are at. And I thank you, Lord, that there's no condemnation. There's no stick in the hand. Uh, there's no beating of the sheep. There is encouragement to take steps toward such a wonderful gift and privilege in that of, being, uh, that of praying and praying over the long haul. I thank you, Lord, that you meet us where we're at and you meet us there without condemnation or guilt. You meet us there so that you can take us to a better place. And I know that any person, that every single person that prays and is looking for your help, that they will get your help. And I thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.